When you're thinking about hacking, you're probably thinking about hacking computer networks. You might be thinking about a hacker hunched over his or her laptop, trying to break into your computer, maybe at this very moment in time. I was a computer hacker once, a long time ago. I can freely admit to this, um, given I was one of the good guys. I worked for a company trying to break into computer systems in order to test the security. But what motivated my younger self was not breaking in. I like to play around with things to figure out how they work. I loved to explore. Doing science is not reserved for academia. In fact, you might say that hacking is doing science in its purest form. Exploration and discovery without boundaries, without imposing limits on what should be known. A quest for discovery, a quest for realization, and not so much a quest for academic publications. I'm now an academic. Uh, I'm a professor at university, so you might be wondering, how could this ever happen? When I was 22, I decided to go to university because my curiosity could not be satisfied by thinking about how to access information. I was fascinated by information, how it can be communicated, shared and distributed. So over time, my horizon expanded, and instead of thinking about networks of computers, I started thinking about networks of particles, atoms and electrons. Just like computers can talk to each other, they can exchange information over a network, particles can talk to each other. They interact, and we can understand these interactions as an exchange of information. So you might think that actually my perspective has not changed much at all. I like to think about information, and I think that information is the key to understanding nature. So when we go from this world of the very large and we zoom in to this small world of few particles, atoms and electrons, things start to work quite differently. The rules that govern the world of the large that is all around us do not apply to the world of the very small. And so to see why this is so, there's kind of two main reasons for this. And the first one is quite simple, namely the small world is quite simply small. Small numbers work differently than large numbers. And in fact, you already know about this. If I take this coin and I'm going to toss it one million times, and I'm going to ask you, so how many heads and how many tails are we going to see in this one million coin tosses? So I've asked this quite a few people, and most people would say, well, there's going to be half heads and half tails. And if you're thinking this, then you would be correct. Anything else is so incredibly unlikely that we might as well forget about it. There's a very simple rule that describes this kind of world of the large, large number of coin tosses. Namely, I just need to remember half heads, half tails, and that's kind of good enough. So if I toss my coin just two or three times, or maybe five times, or 10 times, or 20 times, 100 times, then saying that half of the coin tosses will be heads and half of the coin tosses will be tails is no longer a good description. All kinds of other things are going to happen, and we need more complicated rules to kind of describe what happens if, if I just have a small number of coin tosses. So remember, there were kind of two differences between the world of the very large and the world of the very small. The first one is that small numbers are different than large numbers. The second reason is much more complicated, because the world of the small is governed by the laws of quantum mechanics. And the laws of quantum mechanics, I guess one of the reasons why they're so difficult for us to understand, is because they're not something that we experience in our daily life. Maybe you've heard about some of these quantum effects, 
They have, in fact, very colorful names, like spooky action at a distance, quantum entanglement, quantum uncertainty. Heisenberg's uncertainty principle says that I cannot know the position and the momentum of a particle at the same time. If I know where the quantum particle is, then I don't know how fast it's moving, and if I know how fast it's moving, then I don't know where it is. So this is something that is very counterintuitive to us. And I want to explain to you now why uncertainty is related to information. Let's imagine that we do something actually that a lot of you do all the time. I have two pages of a document, and I want to store them on my computer. Only now my computer is not this large computer that you have at home, but it's this one single quantum particle. And I want to use it to store my two pages. <coughs> to keep things simple, I want to imagine that these two pages are also extremely small. Each page can contain just a single bit, either zero or one. So to encode this on my kind of quantum hard drive, what I'm going to do is if the first page is a zero, I'm going to take my particle and I'm going to move it to the left side of this room. If the first page is a one, I'm going to take this particle and I'm going to move it to the right side of the room. So I've encoded the first page into the position of this particle. If I want to encode the second page, I'm going to take my particle and if it's a zero, I'm going to make it go very, very slowly. And if it's a one, I'm going to make the particle go very fast. I've encoded the second page into the momentum. Now, what Heisenberg's uncertainty principle tells us is that if I want to read my quantum hard drive, I want to look at these two pages again. If I want to read the first page, I would have to figure out where is the particle. Is it on the left or is it on the right? I need to measure position. If I want to read the second page, I need to measure momentum. Is it going fast or is it going slowly? But Heisenberg's uncertainty principle says that I cannot know both position and momentum at the same time. This means when I read, can read page one, I'm uncertain about page two. If I can read page two, I'm uncertain about page one. So you can think that what Heisenberg's uncertainty principle actually is, it is a limit of how much information I can store in just one particle. So quantum uncertainty and it has an expression in the language of information, it's a limit on how much information can be stored, just like the amount of information that you can store on your computer at home is limited. Okay. I'm recently very fascinated how we can use this language of information to study very small machines. Very small machines, like a quantum computing machine or a quantum network machine, a machine that consists of just a few particles. And in fact, we can now build such machines so they actually exist. When talking about machines, we might ask ourselves how energy efficient is a machine? And this is the subject of thermodynamics that tries to find out what is the most efficient machine, for example, that we might ever be able to build. When thermodynamics was invented, people constructed steam engines, huge machines, which are very noisy. They engulfed in smoke and steam, consisting of millions and millions of particles. Large numbers, like large number of coin tosses. The machines that we're making now are so small that with the naked eye, you can't really see them. They consist of just a few particles. But yet, we want to make a statement about how efficient are these machines. We want to study and understand what they can do. I think we're now at a very exciting moment in time, because maybe for the first time in history, we now actually have the tools to understand how information works at the quantum level. Only within the last 15 or 20 years has quantum information theory given us these tools. So I might now ask, uh, have I satisfied my curiosity? In fact, have you satisfied your curiosity? You might ask, have I ever actually stopped hacking? So definitely not. 
there's a lot of things left for you and me to explore, but I believe that information is the key to understanding nature. So go and hack nature. Thank you very much.